It is time to make a little history here on Bogish at the Plate. For the very first time, we have an in-studio guest talking Mets and Yankees with our Play.it colleague, Jake Brown, part of the Brown and Scoop podcast, the very popular Brown and Scoop podcast, Monday through Friday. You can find it on Play.it, and Jake's here to talk Mets and Yankees wearing a shirt and tie. So you went all out fancy to be a... Our first in-studio guest today. You got such a fancy set. You got mm. the initials and everything. Why not wear a gold tie? Initials and lights, fake bats, small <laughs> baseballs, a trophy that's not mine. I dig it. I dig, it. dig it. I like you it. Should. Thanks for having me on. Can you notice where we've hid all of Taz's stuff that we have to move out of the way for, uh, for our little People show? can't see, so no one will know ever. <laughs> we just have a, a nice little setup. I like the figure behind you. It's gold, too. It matches the tie. Yeah, that's actually me. I don't know if you could tell. Oh, that was see? taken to me in my Little League heyday. I see. I'm not holding a bat because I wasn't allowed to play, so that's just what I used to do on the bench. I can never get a hit in Little League. I would bunt it and yeah. sometimes be successful, but go right back to the pitcher. My career ended in one year when I struck out to end the game. And then cried. Um, that bunting was the only thing that I could do that I thought was a real talent. <laughs> In fact, Bob Costas owes me a pizza. Really? I was at Bill Robinson, the former Mets first base coach during the yep. 80s ran baseball camps in the I get I mean it had to be I'm trying to think now it had to be in the summer so it must have been something he did before going to the ballpark. So I mean I was seven or eight years old and Costas came one day to talk to us. And they put out three helmets, like a round home plate, and wanted us to bunt into the helmet. Like, that was the drill. And if anyone got one in, they got a pizza from Bob Costas. And I was the first one to get it in. And I don't remember getting a pizza from Bob Costas. So 20-plus years later, he still is in debt to me. Can we talk to Bob and get you at least a New York pizza, a couple slices? Today, or something? but okay. at some point, yeah, we we'll can figure that out. All right. um, so you and I both are... Long-suffering Met fans hit the yes. pause button a little bit last year, and now I feel like this year we're, we're set up to do a little bit more suffering, starting with Daniel Murphy. I, I can't think of anything ever before like this to go from what he did in October last year for the Mets to coming back now and just kicking them in the gut over and over again. It's unbelievable. And what makes me mad about it, being a Mets fan, one, he was my favorite player. Was he really? Since day one. I saw him in spring wow. training before he was the guy. He had no name on his back. He just okay. had a number. He was like number 99 or something like that, something ridiculous, an obscure number. And he's making $8 million this year. He's yeah. making less than Neil Walker, who's going to be gone after this year if they don't re-sign him. That makes you scratch your head. The guy's the favorite to win the NL MVP right now. Right. I mean, the fact they didn't sign him because of his defense makes me a little mad because you look at the lineup now, and putting him into the Mets lineup now makes them a first-place team. Well, and he also would have been insurance for David Wright in a different way. He could have played third base, mm -hmm. and they could have done something else at second base, Flores, Herrera, whatever it is. But the, the only thing I'll say, I guess, in, in their defense is I didn't think what he did last year in the postseason was the beginning of something. And apparently it is now because he's hitting 400 and can't make an out against them. So, I mean... I didn't see this coming. So if I did see this coming, then I would have said you had to sign him, but I didn't think they had to during the winter. I don't think we saw this coming, but I did see him being a 300 hitter and a better hitter because, I mean, let's be real, it's easier to hit outside of City Field, although they have brought the fence in and all that. Yeah. Um, I think leaving New York was better for him, uh, and I think he's in a position with the Nationals team that kind of collapsed last year, and they were due this year. I know Scoop likes to say on our show, he says, this guy was due, Cam Newton was due, <laughs> do this, do that, do, do whatever. Um, but... Uh, I, I think I did see something good. And he couldn't get worse defensively. He wasn't going to get True. any worse. He's looked better. And you're right. Look at him at third base right now. Reyes is nice and all, but you could have had such a better infield with Murphy here. So we'll see how it works out in the end. But right now, the, the Nationals won that. And for, for that kind of money, in the end, what was he? $13 million a year is the average, I think. Something like that. Uh, which is a couple million more than Neil Walker, who's hitting two sixty. Where are you on Reyes, by the way, in terms of... You know, n not whether he should be out there or not. Just like now, as a fan, that he's actually been out there making plays, hitting home runs over the weekend. Are you? I'm struggling actually to cheer when he does good things. I just don't want to in any way support him. Uh, I'm the opposite. Yeah, and I, that doesn't mean I support beating women, anything well, like that. Of course no. I don't. And people who say that to me it just bothers me because obviously anyone who does support that needs to get their head checked. But I think he has taken the protocols. He was suspended, what, 50 games, 52 yeah. games. He's going along with the counseling and everything that goes along with it. Uh, he served his time and all that, and he's shown so much remorse. We know he's apologetic about it. It was a one-time thing. I'm not, I'm not condoning it, 
but it's over with now. And I know you're in a position where you have family. It's different than what I'm in uh, at my age, but I think the Mets needed a spark, and he's the guy at this point, and you got to look past those things. He's 33, still not in the prime of his career, but he's still at an age in baseball where he could do damage. And we saw it with the bat the other day. We saw it, we've seen it on the base pass. The Mets are the worst team in baseball on the base pass. So I have no issue with it. Um, I think that issue is in the past, but I can see where you're coming from. Yeah, you know, I've I have never argued against him being back out there. I think, as you said, you know, he he, he his suspension happened. Um, he got more apologetic as he got closer to being back with the Mets. So he's back. That's fine. And I was kind of rationalizing it going in, like, all right, if he do, when he does something good, I'm gonna be happy for the Mets, not for Reyes specifically. But even when he does something good now, I just it just feels wrong right now being happy that he's out there doing good things. Not because he shouldn't be out there. It just I just don't feel like he deserves it yet. Like me being happy for him. I understand that, but I think you look at it from the team perspective and you look at it. It's funny. I tell people this, and it's true. I envisioned this happening before the season. I said he would come back to the Mets. I hate to sound like Cleopatra here, but I, I saw this coming because there was no chance the Rockies were keeping him. Right. And the Mets... Uh, I guess you say they got a steal getting for free, really, because they're paying them the minimum. Um, but I don't know, man. I just think you got to look past that and you look for the team, and they needed him in this spot. And it's putting Wilmer Flores in a spot to succeed more as a part time player. I know he's been good recently, but Wilmer Flores is not really an everyday player. He gets a little bit overexposed at the plate. He comes in now in different spots. He plays first, third, second. He can play all over. Uh, I think that's better for him. And you needed a better leadoff bat. I don't think Curtis Granderson no. should ever be in the leadoff spot and he shouldn't have been there uh, in the first place because you're wasting so many RBIs. Every homer he hits is a solo homer. I like him better in the two hole. Uh, it allows Reyes to, because to, we know Granders is very patient. He could draw walks. It allows Reyes to steal. So I think it helps the entire lineup and changes the complexion of the lineup from top to bottom. All right, now big picture moving forward here from the All-Star break. I, I find myself being very pessimistic. Harvey's down. Matt's elbow. Syndergaard's elbow. All the innings for Degrom last year. I still think the offense is kind of is kind of broken right now, and who knows when Dude is coming back. Wright's not coming back, uh, and I kind of think you can't do it in reality. But I think I'm okay if this year we just take a mulligan on it and they start again, kind of fresh next year. I just don't think that this year it's worth going nuts to salvage right now because no matter what to me, they're not as good as Washington, and um, I, you know just going down the stretch. And driving right into the ground to get a wild card game that might be at Dodger Stadium or in Pittsburgh that they're going to lose. I don't know if that's worth. You know, it might be better to have everybody get an extra little bit of break of, of rest here. I would disagree there because I think Zach Wheeler is on his way back. I know it's to be determined when he's back. Right. But he, what's he going to do when he gets back? He'll be back the final four to six weeks, and I think he's had so much rest that he can play a part. And remember, in the playoffs, it's three guys you really need. You need three starters. So if Syndergaard is okay good. DeGrom's been good. Matt's he's still out there. I, I don't think you throw the season of the bag yet because Harvey was terrible anyway the first half. Yeah. I mean he was he was only doing worse for them than doing well. The back end of the bullpen has been good. They're going to get Duda back. You know there's going to be a move made for a bat. There's going to be something done. Um, Cespedes just needs to get healthy. I, I don't think you throw the season of the bag. One, one thing they're in the wild card spot. They're the second team in the wild right. card right now. They're, anyone they throw out there is going to be better, especially if Kershaw doesn't come back from injury as good as he was in the first half. I, I just think it's way too early. There's, what, 75-plus games left. I'm not the kind of guy that's saying throw the season in the bag yet just because Harvey went down and because of some concerns. There's just way too much time left. Yeah, you still have six games versus the Nationals. So... I hate to sound optimistic here, yeah, which no, is rare. It's better than me. Um, but I just think it's way, way too early. And, and people were entering Panic City two weeks ago. And what they do? They went out and sweep the, swept the best team in baseball. Right. Uh, so give it some time because there's just too much baseball left. And you know as Mets fans, we've seen crazier things happen. Cough, cough, yeah. 2007, 2008. All right. Now how about the Yankees? Are they going to be smart enough to actually sell off their pieces before the deadline? This is Brian Cashman's future uh, in his hands right here. I think you have to trade a guy like Carlos Beltran. He's been the best player on the team, which is scary that at what at forty years old almost now. Is he how old is Carlos Beltran? Uh, is, is he thirty yet? Is I mean, he forty? Might as well be forty. He's whatever. He's in the he's joining the AARP club soon. <laughs> I think Carlos Beltran needs to get traded. You have to trade off those pieces because right now, folks, 
the Yankees pitching is just dreadful. You look at the ERAs of that. I don't know why I said folks. I'm talking to you here. I'm bogus. <laughs> we bogus do have listeners players. and viewers. Um, <laughs> um, I just think the rotation is just so bad. They're all over five. Sabathia's been so inconsistent. Tanaka's really been the force. But you have to trade Chapman. You have to trade Belchon because these are rentals that you need to get prospects and particularly pitching. We're seeing some good stuff from Ref Snyder. Let's see the other guys, Judge and Sanchez, get their shot because they're a 500 team. There's six teams ahead of them in the wild card. There's the fourth place in the division. Yeah. I mean, it's it's lost for the Yankees. Now, you, you mentioned Brian Cashman right away there. Uh, obviously, he's in charge, but should he be in charge? I mean, do you, if you're a Yankee fan, do you trust him with making the next round of decisions for this organization? I think this offseason and this trading deadline is going to determine his future. If he keeps these older bats and gets nothing for him, I think this may be the time that you can him. I've always been against canning Brian Cashman. The guy's won five World Series. He's right. won seven AL pennants. Uh, the team has always been consistent. They've been filling the seats, but filling the seats is starting to change. People aren't really showing up like they used to at Yankee Stadium. The Mets have been the talk of the town the last couple of years, which we love, but I just think this is do or die for Brian Cashman. You have to trade. And I'm against trading Andrew Miller, by the way. For $9 million a year, for what yeah. he's done, there's no reason to trade him or Dell and Batances. But Chapman and Belchon, if they're on their team at the end of this season, bye-bye, Cashman. Well, enjoy it while we can until Bryce Harper and or Mike Trout are Yankee. Oh, it's already, it's already locked and set in at stone. At least one yeah. of them. Yep. And that will be the worst thing ever. Yeah. Well, we're used to it in New York. We're All used right. to it in Queens. So Monday through Friday – at least two interviews per day for Brown and Scoop. Some three. Yeah, you never know what you're going to get. Uh, sports, entertainment, lifestyle, Pokemon, active yeah. voiceovers, uh, Dr. Ben Carson. You really never know what's coming. I, so how do you how do you get Ben Carson? We have Is that a you or a Scoop? No, scoop? we have we have a friend of the program uh, helping us do some stuff. Um, but he's we've been getting some big names. Ken Shamrock. Yeah, uh, will be on in the coming weeks. Uh, Bobby Valentine. A lot of. I don't even know what's coming some days because we have a lot of pre-recorded stuff in the docket, so right. uh, it's going to be a good summer. All right, check that out, play.it. It's Brown and Scoop. Follow Jake, Jake at Jake Brown Radio on Twitter. We thank him for stopping by and Matt Snyder. And to you for listening and or watching, we'll see you next week back here on Bogish at the Plate. <laughs>